Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Today we're going to take an in-depth look at the 50th anniversary Flying V Brimstone Burst that Gibson did in 2008. Now, you might be saying, huh, that's a really strange looking Flying V. Super 400 inlays binding on the headstock. What's with this goofy logo and this whole body shape? It's a little bit different than you normally see on a Flying V. All right, I can explain this all in four words. Guitar of the month. <laughs> As we learned last week when we talked about the SG3, after the Guitar of the Week series in 2007, Gibson followed that up with something called Guitar of the Month. Now personally, I think they kind of halfway did Guitar of the Month because a lot of them were just doubles, they just did them in a different color, but they created a new guitar every month limited to 1,000 in production. This was the second one of the series made in March, because technically it ran until January of 2009. But 2008 happened to be the 50th anniversary of the original Karina style Flying V, as well as the Explorer. So there's also an Explorer version that looks very similar to this. And if you feel like completing a set, they also made Les Pauls in this finish in 2009. But speaking of this goofy logo, what is it? Is it just some art deco thing that they decided to create? No, this is actually a Ted McCarty design. You know, one of the famed presidents of Gibson back in the day. This was in like his design book. It was something that I don't believe was ever used, but they had recently discovered it around the time that these things were made. So in order to honor him, they decided to put him on these guitars. I don't think I would call it ugly, but it's definitely interesting. So spec-wise on these guys, you have a rather weak maple top on them, but there's a little bit of flame on this one. They graded it as double A for these. But what they were really trying to do was bring out the brimstone burst here. It's kind of like a red and black. It's almost kind of similar to a new Slash model that's coming out. But it is a 50 style flying V, meaning it has these kind of more chunkier heels right here. It's a little bit wider in the way it feels, but these aren't Karina like the original Karina ones. They still have the mahogany body. And on top of that, they gave it these contours. And what's really nice about having this right here is it kind of reminds me of the flying V2, the scary V where you have this contour right here. It, it reminds me of like playing an explorer for some reason. I mean, it's pretty comfortable to play in that aspect. This particular one, it's a little bit neck heavy, especially once it starts going. After this point, it just wants to fall. But to kind of help illustrate some of the other differences that this guitar has, let's go ahead and compare it to like a 67 style flying V so you can see it side by side. Headstock to headstock, the most noticeable thing is the binding and the Art Deco Gibson logo with that red mother of pearl inlay. And the truss rod covers are different as well. The 50th anniversary has one that's more similar to a Les Paul, whereas you have the three screw with the Gibson logo on the 67 style. The tuners are also different, but not a huge comparison here because of something I'll tell you later. But Super 400 inlays versus the dot inlays, ebony fretboard versus rosewood, on top of that, you even have gold frets on this 50th anniversary model. Next up are the pickups. Uh, they're both uncovered in this model, but stock, it would have had gold covers on them. But notice, there's no pick guard on this one. That's what makes it completely different from a 67 or a 58 style Flying V. And also, once again, notice the body contours. Not something that a Flying V usually has. Backside of the headstock, eh, nothing too different here besides the binding along the fretboard. You only normally see that on like a Flying V Custom. Then most Flying Vs are top routed, whereas this one is back routed since obviously, again, doesn't have the pick guard. And the other big thing for this one is it came stock with Steinberger gearless tuners. Now you used to be able to take those off of your guitar and sell them on eBay for like 350 bucks because Gibson bought the Steinberger brand back in the 80s and they pretty much did nothing with it. But upon the revival of new Gibson now, you can actually finally buy those themselves separately for cheap. I mean, look on their website, anywhere between $99 to 129 gets you a set depending on if you want black, chrome, or gold. This particular one, if you haven't noticed yet, it's been highly modified. But let's go ahead and throw this one on the workbench and we'll talk a little bit more about those. Taking a look on the inside of this one, the pickups have been swapped out on this guitar. According to Gibson, it originally had 57 classics with a plus in the bridge. 
But currently we're rocking a Seymour Duncan 59 in the neck, and then in the bridge position we have a Demarzio Tone Zone. Now, I remember that one, Tone Zone. It was in the Ibanez that I had, and I really liked that pickup. So I'm kind of interested to hear how that'll sound in this setup. This has got to be one of the sloppiest neck pickup cavities I've ever seen from Gibson, though. I mean, look at that. From the end of the neck tendon, there's just like a bunch of dull router bits all bunched up right here, and then they just got painted over. It does the job, I guess, right? And the bridge pickup cavity reads DSVSD. The bridge on this model is a traditional Nashville style. It just says PW on it. And the tailpiece is a standard full weight version. This thing was definitely heavily played. There's just like some haziness to the finish right here. I polished it up the best I could, but you can also see very fine finish checking running up and down this guitar. So what that tells me is this was probably in a high humidity area for a while. I mean, the neck's good and everything on it, but there's definitely some other things we'll have to talk about. The knobs have been replaced definitely, and potentially even the whole three-way toggle switch system, because that's not gold and that's not normally the style you would see on a Gibson. Also, originally the three-way toggle switch was down here, so somebody's kind of swapped the electronics around to suit their preferences. Personally, I think having that toggle switch a little bit closer is a little bit more useful, to me anyways, because even having your volume up here there, it's not quite volume swellable, but <laughs> close enough. Your output jack there, and once again, the contouring to the body right here. Spec-wise, it's a maple top on top of a mahogany body with a mahogany neck. And here's what's kind of cool with this guy. The ebony fretboard with the Super 400 inlays that go all the way up the neck. That's not traditional. Usually these stop after 17th fret. So that's kind of more like a Les Paul Supreme thing going on. And if you take a really close look at these frets, they're actually gold in color. Now, if you do the steel wool treatment that I usually do, you almost seem to erase the goldenness of it, but then it comes back after a little bit. Personally, I think gold frets, it sounds really cool, doesn't it? But it just makes your frets look rusty regardless of what you do to clean them. So it's awesome in theory, but not necessarily in practice. This instrument also suffers from that oh-so-common late 90s to mid-2000s issue where the fretboard binding actually separates a little bit from the fret and causes a gap. Now, depending on your playing style, your string can get caught in that, and it's really annoying. Personally, I don't run into too many issues with it, but I could see how it definitely affects some people. So I'm always looking for that so I can disclose it. The only way to fix that is pretty much to sand off your nibs and then level off your fret. I'm pretty sure you could do that. A lot of luthiers will try to talk you into just doing a complete refret though. The truss rod cover is brass. It reads 50th for 50th anniversary. And once you take that away, you get your fancy Gibson logo and this kind of red inlaid mother of pearl thing. I used to think that was just kind of like a red finish on top of the headstock. No, it almost kind of has a, a modern flying V thing going on. <laughs> Once again, notice the multiply binding on the headstock and the tuners have been swapped out on this one. I get a 1.7 inch nut width, which increases to 2.11 at the 12th. So it's a rather wide feeling neck. Then our first fret here is 0.84 and increases to 0.89 by the 12th. So kind of a wide, thin feeling neck here but it still sports that 24 and 3 quarters inch scale. And here's what the backside of the V looks like. Now, unfortunately, when somebody did those modifications, they lost the original backplate. Yeah, I made this really crappy looking one. It's better than nothing. I kind of held off on this review, hoping maybe I could find another one so I could send the backplate in to get it duplicated, but eh, nope. No luck, let's just get this one out there. But it looks like you do have two original Gibson branded pots. Then your three-way toggle switches here. And then your output jack has its own little special container. Similar to what you would normally see for a three-way toggle. Now this thing has seen heavy wear. I mean, these aren't like smudges or anything. These are actually nicks and dings within the finish. You can see this must have got dinged up. There's a, I wouldn't say it's cracking, but it's like a finish impression mark around there. Probably from over tightening or something like that. And the other location is right here and you can see all that finish checking. But thankfully, no 
breaks, cracks, or repairs that you really have to worry about. And the back might look black, but here's a nice good look at the brimstone burst finish. How it's actually kind of like a really dark maroon color, kind of similar to what Oxblood does. How it looks black from certain angles, but red at others. The only other thing to talk about right here is there's another ding. I mean, that's a pretty aggressive looking ding, but it's not actually a break. And these were numbered one through a thousand. This is number 687. You've got your traditional serial number right there, as well as a made in USA stamp and the year. And of course, these tuners. I think they're a really cool replacement for this guitar. I love the look of waffle backs. All put back together, it weighs six pounds, 15.4 ounces. So pretty much seven pounds right there. Now, before we get into the tones of the instrument, I want to talk a little bit more about that binding gap. This one is so extreme that it's almost slightly useful in a strange way. So typically what'll happen is your note will just get caught if you happen to get it in that gap and then you just get a buzzed out note. But this one's so extreme around like the fifth, seventh, and ninth fret that you could actually use it as a new technique to bend your note up a whole step really quickly. So you could make like a little jazzy thing out of that. Sure, you could do the same lick doing this. I just think it sounds cooler and cleaner bending it off the fretboard like that. Now you can do that with your other guitars, but since there's not a little ledge that keeps it in place, sometimes it can be hard to get that consecutively. You know, the other time I found that useful was with distortion. <laughs> So that's something quirky about this one. Let's go ahead and hear the neck pickup.